I am extremely grateful and I feel very honored and proud to be in the mid midst of this white army. And I always uh, feel very happy coming to Bangalore. Usually it used to be physical meeting in BMC and I used to enjoy coming there. It is like a second uh, hometown for me. And I see a lot of postgraduates uh, who have joined and I'm extremely uh, thankful to Dr. Nagalada for this uh, wonderful suggestion that uh, we will go ahead with the nutrition viva. And thank you, Asre, for uh, being the rapporteur here and uh, for uh, felicit uh, facilitating this one. So, uh, I know uh, some students are re really um, little panic when they think of nutrition, what will be asked. And even some of us also uh, feel, what shall we ask in the nutrition session? So I thought I will organize all my thoughts and then share it with you. And uh, who is there to be our students for today? Uh, I think Aishwarya. Huh? Uh, Shanti, Aishwarya, Swati is there. Huh? Uh, and so so get, please yes. uh, unmute yourself and... Uh, uh, Usha start. also is there, yes. Okay. Uh, because, you know, we want it to be in a different mode rather than I lecturing and all of you listening. I want some interaction from you. Maybe wonderful thoughts may be coming from your side, I am sure. And it may become even a learning session for me. So we reinforce, we, when we teach, we learn. That is the best way of uh, learning also. So uh, what is usually done in a nutrition session is, we keep a tray full of food groups and uh, vegetables and sometimes some growth charts may also be kept there. And the usual questions which we put across to the undergraduates will be uh, select the protein rich food from this uh, tray, which is the iron rich food, which is a vitamin A rich food. I, I think for a postgraduate, it will be too simple for them uh, to answer such a question. Then sometimes we may ask, okay, there is a two year old child you choose whatever you want to give to this child. For what will you give for breakfast, for 10 o'clock, lunch? We say five food grows, five colors, five times for a toddler, isn't it? And whenever you choose, you must tell me this is for energy, this is for protein, this is for vitamin A, like that. We, we try to make it very interesting. Of course, uh, usually we say that the cereals and roots and tubers are for energy, Pulses and nuts are for energy and protein. Uh, uh, vegetables are for multiple micronutrients and fiber. And fruits are for micronutrients, antioxidants and fiber. Then the non-vegetarian items, mostly for protein, micronutrients, iron. Then milk and milk products. They give us protein, calcium, phosphorus, micronutrients. Then one step ahead, sometimes we take the egg and ask, what is the micronutrient and macronutrient lacking in this? So I think Aishriya or uh, Swati or one of you can try to answer. Please answer. And if you can answer fast, we can go ahead. Which micronutrient and which macronutrient is lacking in egg? Anybody can uh, type in the chat box. Any answers? Asre, any answers are there? Not it. Shanti, Nestle, vitamin C. Vitamin C. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Who wrote that? Uh, who answered? Uh, excellent. That is correct. Which macronutrient is lacking in egg? Sometimes we may jokingly ask how many carbohydrate, how much carbohydrate they even give a figure also. So it is, it lacks carbohydrate. It is not a carbohydrate food. Huh? That is something. So when you learn, you learn the exceptions. We say that cereals will give roughly 10 gram of protein and 350 kilocalories. And then learn the exception. Maybe rice will give only 7 gram, but the quality of the protein, and which is the rate limiting amino acid, which is the rate limiting amino acid in rice or cereals? Which is the rate limiting amino acid? Two people can unmute and answer. And lysine and methionine. Lysine. 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 Methionine is deficient in the pulses. Huh? Yes. So the rate limiting amino acid. So we, 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 we learned like that. Then pulses will generally give 20 gram of protein, 350 or 80 calories. And then learn the exception. The exception, my book also gives that table. And the sixth edition of the book is going to be launched at NOIDA. 
So you, those who don't have, you can buy that book. But the table will be there. And the exception to the rule is soya beans. It has got 43 gram protein and 430 kilocalories. So the exception to the rule you learn. Huh? Like that you can learn. Then suppose you are asked to write a rainbow diet. We integrate it with the my plate. That is 50% of your diet for a day. You do an audit of the day of a child also. It should be vegetables and fruits. That is the JOR part of it, I say. G-Y-O-R. Green, yellow, orange, red. So four colors are there. That is the vegetables and fruits. And then the fifth color will be brown color. That is uh, representing the whole grain or multi grains. It is not the maida or the rava, etc. The, uh, the whole grain and then also roots and tubers. And then the sixth color is purple color. Now, previously we used to put it as a, um, pulses, non-vegetarian. Now we put it as a protein group. And most of the pulses, the non-vegetarian items, as well as the nuts and oil seeds and all will come there. And then diary, that is the seventh color. So the, the new plate has got seven colors. That is green, yellow, orange, red, then brown, then purple, and then white, milk and milk products. Now, what are type 1 and type 2 nutrients? Or otherwise, I will ask you in a different way, which is the functional nutrient, which is the growth nutrient? Any takers? Any takers? Type 1 is the macronutrient. Oh. Actually, type 1, I asked functional and growth nutrients. Type 1 is the functional nutrients. In English alphabet, F comes before G, isn't it? So type 1 is F. That is how you, you must learn like that. Something which you can recollect. Type 1 means functional nutrients. And, the, and see, when type 1 is deficient, there is deficiency sign, but growth is not much affected. And the beauty is that you can run a program and store up the type 1 nutrients. What are they? The iron, iodine, copper, calcium, selenium. This is there in the nutrition book also. You can refer in the net also. So there will be specific deficiency signs, but no growth failure in type 1 uh, nutrient deficiency. Whereas look at type 2, there is no particular deficiency sign, but there is growth failure. So learn these nine items. They are the growth nutrients. And it cannot be stored up. A child will have to take it every day. For example, nitrogen. Every day it has to go for bodybuilding. Every day essential amino acid pool has to be replenished. Potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, sulfur, zinc, sodium and chloride. These are said to be the growth nutrients which you cannot store up. Every day you may have to take it. So growth nutrients. But there is some controversy regarding zinc. Sink is at both. Actually, it is both. It is a functional nutrient as well as a growth nutrient. But why this is included in the growth nutrients, I'll come to in the next slide. See, there is a global hidden hunger index. Have you heard of that? And in India is in the serious uh, group. That is, we have somewhere around 30% global hidden hunger index. So there are three micronutrients which are scored. The deficiency of three micronutrients is scored to get the global hidden hunger index. Can anybody tell me which are the three, three uh, micronutrients which are scored in this? The global hidden hunger index. No, un no answers, I think. Uh, iron, iron they have put, ma'am. Iron they have put. Very good. If you if you are not answering, you just say pass so that I can just go ahead, no? Because time is very important. Think yeah? iron and copper they have put in time. Uh -huh. So global hidden hunger index. See, in 2013, we were at 45. And now India is at 30. Still, still 20 to 34.9 is the yellow, yellow zone. 2019 global hidden hunger index. You can see the picture, I believe. Huh? Okay. And so what is there? The three micronutrients which are included in the global hidden hunger index is iron one because 
it is it they represents your oxygen carrying capacity and your stamina and your uh, ability to function uh, with your brain cognition everything uh, myelination everything now we know iron is so much important then vitamin a, a is a marker of immunity and your skin and mucous membrane health that is uh, epithelium and mucous membrane health and zinc they have added as a surrogate of stunting how much stunting is happening so that is why we prefer to put zinc in the growth nutrient as a growth nutrient rather than a functional nutrient we know it is a functional nutrient also so the exception to the rule you must learn and then sometimes you may be asked to tell about the the less popular sources of iron that is i am i am just giving you usually we we know uh, the green leafy vegetables and all we say but garden cress seeds or halu then sesame seeds uh, the uh, that is a rich source amaranth and jaggery we always say raisins dates this and except the and also the uh the non vegetarian items if i am ask what is the iron rich food i will say 4 g's plus heme iron heme iron is from the uh, organ meat mutton liver uh, the non vegetarian items what are the 4 g's grams grains greens grapes and dry dry fruits but because there is lot of phytates uh, and polyphenols in that Uh, the absorption will be less so the uh, next question you have chosen the uh, iron rich food from this you have chosen amaranth you have chosen dates something like that you have done but then the question is what are the anti nutrients present in the diet itself one is the phytates then in coffee and tea the the tannin and all and polyphenols now the national institute of nutrition research says that polyphenols in amla is is an anti nutrient to iron we used to think that we can put amla in jaggery and take it as an iron rich food they say that guava may be better than amla because polyphenols are less so that takes us to the next question what is the phytate iron ratio it should be less than 0.4 is to 1 and then we know that vitamin c will promote iron iron absorption so what is the vitamin c to iron ratio it is more than 4 is to 1 so remember 4 and 1 then you you can answer now we go to the next thing that is uh, uh, what is ecdn anyone can answer maybe in the chat box also ecdn is the most popular uh, workshops going on these days any takers early childhood development nutrition a uh, very good excellent early childhood development and nutrition and that focuses usually to the window period what is the window period window of opportunity for us which period um, first 1000 days of excellent 1000 days so minus 9 pregnancy period to plus 24 now they say that there is an extended window period we can't imagine that on the on the second birthday all the window will suddenly close it won't close there will be an extended window period so we say that up to 3 years so 0 to 3 years is now uh, said to be one group and then 3 to 6 years they are sitting in the anganwadi they get supplementary feeding all sort of uh, programs are there for them okay and then pre pregnancy that is before pregnancy also there is an opportunity so the window of opportunity extends beyond this first 1000 days it is from maybe it starts earlier before pregnancy definitely no the ovum will have the health or the epigenetic tax etc on them and then the window period extends to the plus 3 uh, 3 uh, years then how much uh, extra food is needed during pregnancy and lactation we know that uh, the icds is running a supplementary feeding program for children and pregnant and lactating mothers anybody knows how much is the ration they are getting so the latest is that uh, below 6 years 
500 kilo calories and 15 gram of protein daily for 300 working days, which will be one third of the energy requirement and half of the protein needs of the baby, of the child. Then severely malnourished are entitled to get 800 kilo calories and 20 gram of protein. And the pregnant and lactating will get 600 kilo calories and 20 gram of protein. I think it is worth remembering that how much is the supplementary food which is eligible from the Anganwadi. Then recommended dietary allowances, we always look at ICMR. When was the ICMR recommendation revised last? Which is the latest? Anybody? ICMR, which year? 2020. Very good. Vidhu, I think, has answered. Uh, um, ICMR 2020. So you must have a look at the ICMR 2020. And uh, what is the relevance of a reference child with, recommend, with, uh, with respect to the RDA? RDA is prescribed for the reference man, reference woman, reference child. That means it is for the ideal weight. Huh? Today also we were conducting the model examination and one student was telling the requirement is 700 kilo calories for a one year old child. I asked, how did you get that? And he said, seven kilo, 100 calories per kilo because somebody taught them like that. Huh? But it is not that one year old malnourished will get less calories and one year old obese will get more calories. It is for the reference child. So it will be 1000 calories, 10 kilo. Huh? So that is something which you must have. And then the estimated average requirement is, the, is, is the, perhaps the lowest. And the RDA is kept plus two standard deviations because people, many children are swinging to the right of the bell-shaped, the, the right part of the bell-shaped curve. But then comes the UL. What is UL? That is the tolerable upper limit. And then comes the no observed, no, uh, no observed adverse events level and then low observed adverse event level. No L and no A. So we must have a concept and this ICMR 2020 is speaking about tolerable upper limits of nutrients. And I will take your attention that iron, the tolerable upper limit of nutrients in health is only 45 milligram for an adult. But we may be giving much more. That may be why the school program is failing. The children are not taking the tablet. Okay. But uh, when you are having the disease, iron deficiency, anemia, higher doses can be tolerated or higher doses are indicated. Look at folate. It is only one milligram. But because some company is producing five milligram, we are giving five uh, uh, pre-pregnancy, pre periconceptional folic acid. That is not needed. Only four. prevention that is a mother on mother is having an already affected child or mother is having folate related polymorphism or uh, uh, what else so how will it be how will it be anybody knows it is four milligrams 400 microgram is for primary prevention and for secondary prevention, it is 4 milligram. But we are now giving 5 milligram for everybody till they start the IFA tablets. And see the vitamin D, 4000 IU per day. So if you are a healthy person taking a prophylactic vitamin D and you do not have any, if you do not have any, um, vitamin D deficiency and you cannot have sun exposure. So 30 days, how much you must take? 60K into two sachet only is needed. Okay. Only two sachet are needed. So, but some people are take, taking 60K every week. That will lead to a toxic level. So 
so you must uh, the my point is that you must uh, learn rda icmr 2020 there are certain slight changes and the tolerable upper limit is also given there when it comes to micronutrients this is what i i teach my students you can remember 5 10 and 15 b1 b2 b6 it is 0.5 to 1.5 mg per day younger the child you can say 0.5 older the child you can say 1.5 and you look at the unit it is mg per day and b3 or niacin there is no decimal it is 5 to 50 and folic acid and b12 have a different role they are important in rbc maturation etc and it is microgram so folic acid is 50 to 150 and b12 is 0.5 to 1.5 microgram vitamin c maybe you can say 50 mg vitamin a th- a d e r preferably in international units 1500 iu vitamin d 400 iu vitamin e 5 to 15 iu like that so iron zinc so try to learn like this as a group and then keep it now the next question may be uh, what is responsive feeding because now a days with the bfhi uh, we don't speak about scheduled feeding we don't speak even about demand feeding suppose a baby is not demanding can we just leave the baby like that no we have to get the cues and then feed it so this mother is showing a cue what is what, what how will you describe this mother and ba- baby anybody wants to answer responsive means responding to the baby eye contact is there no baby is smiling mother is smiling so that is it baby is trying to catch hold ba- mother is allowing and these are the hunger cues so hunger cues in a newborn what is early cue you can say the baby is opening the mouth turning the head and mid cue is stretching the hands and taking the hand to the mouth and the the last cue will be the late cue will be crying agitated then they won't feed then you will have to pacify them and then uh, then only we can feed so the mother should understand the hunger cue and she will get enough time to prepare to give because they will show the early cue the mid cue by that time she should be feeding and whenever a toddler is being fed there should they should they should have a seat and what is the best seating 90 90 90 what is that 90 degrees at angle of hips 90 degrees at angle of knees and 90 degrees at angle angle of ankles and then you may be asked about what is the stomach size of a newborn any anybody what is shown there you can answer you can shout the those who are unmuted uh, those the designated candidates it is like cherry. a cherry size cherry cherry size at 3 days it is like a what is shown oh. there walnut walnut one week an apricot and 3 to 4 weeks an egg so we learn no 20 ml per kg we can give 30 ml per kg is the stomach size etc but on day one they need only 20 ml per day that is why the colostrum is only 40 or 100 ml per day they need very little little and then the next question is during complementary feeding they are going to ask why added salt and sugar are not recommended during infancy is it because they don't have the taste buds any Super answer tasteless. correct very good so they can taste all the five flavors salt sour bitter sweet and savory or umami they call it they are super tasters their taste buds are very close by so if i if they develop a liking towards sugar they will always demand sugar if they have a liking to salt they will always demand salt and you know the refined sugar is one of the risk factors for obesity so we don't want that and sugar is an ultra processed food sugar cane is a natural food the color the texture that the taste everything changes when it comes as sugar and sodium is present in most of the food and their salt requirement is very little 
and their kidney is very immature. That is why we don't recommend added sugar and salt. Uh, for the extra salt and sugar are not recommended. Then how can you ensure fiber for a three-year-old child? The items are there, you can choose. How much uh, is the requirement of fiber for a three-year-old child? It is 18, 18, years, 18, years, 18 years plus five, it is written there. So how much is there? Eight gram. Okay. And two small fruits like strawberry will give four gram of fiber. One apple, a large fruit may give four gram of fiber. One tuber like a carrot will give four gram of fiber. And 50 gram of green leafy vegetables will give four gram of fiber. If the child can take two plates, that is items from two plates, that their eight gram will be satisfied. Then some examiners are very fond of asking, what is ARF? What is ARF? I have given a clue there. How will you prepare it? And what are the advantages? Malting, sprouting, ah. so okay. sprouting and then soaking, sprouting, malting, sprouting. So these three things we do. So amylase rich food is germinated cereals or pulses that can be dried and then the skin and all can be removed and we can just sun dry it or roast it till 70 degree. That is the time when our, uh, in the tawa, this, uh, uh, the grain will start moving quickly. You know, when it is very wet, it won't move, no? When we try to move it, huh? it won't move. So once it starts, that, that uh, the texture changes. That is at 70 degrees and that is the time. You should not overdo the uh, roasting. Then the amylase will be denatured. And it, it has got increased micronutrients. The digestibility will be more. It will be more energy dense and it will reduce the bulk of cooking. So any item, I am preparing ragi, but I have an amylase rich food with me. When I switch off the flame, I add one or two spoons of the amylase rich powder, which I have prepared and kept. And the bulk will come down and the digestibility, everything will go up. So now the next question is what is ARS? Some clue is there? ARS? Amylase rich starch. Amylase resistant starch. That was amylase rich food. This is amylase resistant starch. That means this carbohydrate, which is present in the green banana, in the green jackfruit, in the sweet uh, potato, etc., is not digested. And so glycemic index is said to be very low or zero. That will pass undigested to the colon and will get fermented into short-chain short fatty acids, acetate, propionate, butyrate, etc. It is a fuel for the colon. So it will improve the health of the colon. And this uh, fatty acids can be used as fuel, but it is not the sugar which is coming up as the fuel. And this is also very good for recovery of children with acute diarrhea because their colon and everything is going to regenerate. And even the ordinary potato, it, it is said that if you can cook it and cool it in the refrigerator, the, it becomes more amylase resistant. Okay. Then this is, what is AS, AS of, what is AS of, WHO has put a new term AS of, that is animal source of food. When can you give the animal source of food during complementary feeding? That may be the next question. There is an egg in the tray. So I'm asking you at what age? You tell the mother at what age you can give the egg. After the measles vaccination, nine months. Hmm, that is a myth actually. Eh? Okay. So look at this. MDD is minimum dietary diversity. Huh? There should be 
minimum dietary diversity. This is, I have adopted this from the ECDN module and WHO. Six to 23 months of age. They have said that you can give grains, roots and tubers, milk and milk products, fruits and vegetables, fish uh, uh, and flesh food, legumes, eggs. They have not said when. Actually, it is said that it will depend upon the, the, cult, the culture and the custom and the belief. In Western world, they start soup and all early. So there is nothing like that, that uh, you, you should wait for the measles vaccination, etc. So WHO says that animal source food can be started depending on the culture and the custom. The, the complementary feeding is the systematic introduction of the right type of food at the right age in order to meet the nutritional demands of the baby. The right type of food at the right age, that is all. So there is nothing like that. But usually we keep it like this. Six months we call them and tell them about complementary feeding. That time we tell them about cereals, pulses, roots, tubers, vegetables and fruits. And then next when they come at nine months, we tell them about the next type of food, animal source of food. That is why we, we say that it, it is given after, usually after nine months. Okay. So there is no hard and fast rule like that. WHO says that animal source food can, is one of the items in the dietary diversity of 6 to 23 month old. And then what is MMF minimum meal frequency? See, 6 to 8 months we say, okay, you start with 1 to 2 meals, extra complementary feeding other than breastfeeding and slowly increase it. And a complementary feeding is having minimum dietary diversity when at least four food groups are there. Okay. And minimum meal frequency should reach minimum four times by one year. I always say toddler should be five, five food groups, five colors, five, uh, five times. But WHO says that at least four times if extra is given, it is taken as minimum meal frequency and minimum acceptable diet is one which has got the quantity, quality, frequency, texture, taste, hygiene, everything is there. And it is said that in India only 6% of the 6 to 23 month old get minimum acceptable diet. That is it. And so some somebody is vegetarian. An adolescent girl is coming, she's vegetarian. What are what advice will you give? Is she liable to any, any uh, deficiencies or is it the best diet she can have? She is very environment friendly. B12 deficiency. Yeah. Strict vegetarians are at high risk of B12. They are also at risk of iron because, because you know that heme iron is better absorbed, no? calcium, vitamin D, zinc, and some of the complete proteins of high biological value. So strict vegetarians. Then fruitarians are there. Those who eat only fruit, they are at high risk of protein and sodium deficiency. Sodium deficiency. Fruits have less sodium. So how can you improve the diet of a vegetarian? You might, what advice you can give? Add some tree nuts. They can add some ground nuts. They can have bran of the grains, germinated sprouts. Then what about fermented food and pickled food? It is said that B12 is there. The bacteria which is there in the pickled and fermented food is synthesizing some B12. So this is new information. Then if they can, they can add some dairy products or their diet should be fortified. Fortified cereal. In the Western world, every, every cereal is fortified. And lacto-over-vegetarians have very little nutritional risk. Who is a flexitarian? Who is a flexitarian? They are semi-vegetarians. That is, most, mostly they are vegetarians, but occasionally they take non-vegetarian. There are a lot of people like that. So that term is there, flexitarian. 
What do you mean by junk food? What is the junk's guideline? When was that released by IAP? Junk's guideline? 2020. 2019. Ah. Junk, junk food? What is junk food? Junk food means high in fat, high in salt, high in sugar, HFSS. This was accepted by the Delhi High Court also during a case. So as early as 1972, this junk food term was coined. High in fat, high in salt, high in sugar. Whatever you go and buy from outside is usually high in fat, high in salt, high in sugar. And U stands for ultra processed food. There is a NOVA classification of ultra processed food. NOVA 1, 2, 3, 4. When it comes to 3 and 4, it is too much processed and too much chemicals are there. Shelf life is long. Suppose bread, if you take bread, it is NOVA 1. What does that mean? It, it can, it, the shelf life may be only for one week or so. Okay. But something, if, if I process and take sugar the shelf life is any 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 number of weeks or months or years it will remain there no if uh, if uh, moisture is not there then n stands for nutritionally inappropriate what does that mean coffee and tea being given to an infant or a toddler a, um, creatine containing sports drink is given to a child that is nutritionally inappropriate then C is for colored, caffeinated cola drinks, which has got caffeine. Caffeine is not good for some of these contain caffeine, which is not good for the CNS and the CVS. And S is sugar sweetened beverages. For example, I'll give you an example. Learn to read the food labels. You may be given a food label and, and read this. See, your lassi even is having 30 gram of sugar. So it is written there on the packet. So that is it. Actually, 100 gram of our traditional food will give 100 kilocalories. But look at that fruit drink. It is giving 600 kilocalories. And look at your double-decker burger. It is giving 100 gram will give 1100 kilocalories. So that is the importance of reading the labels. A McDonald's is going to give you 1265 kilocalories and that you take as a snack. Actually, it is more than 50% of your total daily intake. We must know something about the lipids and what is the, uh, the lipid requirement that visually is recommended? How much carbohydrate, how much fat, how much protein? The proportion. Usually we take, we recommend 55 to 60% of carbohydrate, 15 to 20% of protein and 30, 35% of fat. But Indian diet may be giving up to 70 to 75% as carbohydrate and protein may be very less, 5% and fat also may be less in some, most of the communities. So now we say that 30% of your fat should come from three types of fat. That is saturated fat, less than 10%, monounsaturated fatty acid, more than 10%, and polyunsaturated fatty acid, 10%. So can you tell me some examples of uh, MUFA oil, MUFA, monounsaturated fat, that you have to take more than 10%. So, monounsaturated fat is oleic acid, groundnut, rice bran, sesame, olive oil. Okay. And the polyunsaturated fat is two types omega 6 and omega 3. And omega 6 is plenty in sunflower oil, safflower oil, soybean oil, etc. But omega 3 is mostly present in fish oil, but vegetarians can get. Omega-3 from 
leafy green, walnuts, chia seeds, mustard oil, rice bran oil. So now I find that rice bran oil is having MUFA, it is having omega-3, which is not present in other oil. So the moral of the story is that reduce your oil consumption and use it at room temperature as far as possible because heating and reheating will lead to oxidation, peroxidation and lot of uh, oxidation damage can occur and then rotate your oils. So don't stick to one oil. You can rotate your oils so that you get all these, th these three. Now what is trans fat? Some clue is there. What do you mean by trans fat and how much is permitted? Trans fat? Four percentage. Trans fat is what, what which solidifies at room temperature. It is the dalda, the vanaspadi and the animal fat. Then people may ask what about ghee? Ghee has what? 4% trans fat. And it is said that the current FSSAI recommendation is that trans fat should be limit is 5%. But they say that by 2021, it should come down to 3%. And by 2022, it should come down to 2%. And coconut oil solidifies, but usually the trans fat is man-made. It is not present in the natural form. So coconut oil is not a trans fat but it is a saturated fat. So only less than 10% of your oil consumption can be coconut oil. It cannot be 30% of your energy cannot come from coconut oil. Pardon? Priyanka, please unmute yourself. Now growth charts are there. Okay. So if a growth chart like this is given, see, I'm showing a 11 year old child with 125 centimeters. And the next question I'm going to ask you is what is the expected? So project it to the 50th percentile and I find that it is 145 centimeters. Then I ask what is the height age of this child? So project it horizontally to the 50th percentile and I get that he is seven and a half year old. So his Height age is seven and a half years and the expected is 145. So I'm really concerned about this child. So what do I do? What do I do next? Plot what? What do you have to plot? Weight. No, no. Mid-parental height. Mid-parental height. So I have plotted the mid-parental height and it is below third percentile. This child is also below third percentile. What may be the probable diagnosis of this child's growth retardation? Familial. Very good. Familial short stature. Suppose it was constitutional delay, the mid-parental height would have been higher where he should reach. And IAP has given the beautiful charts like this. And have you seen these charts? There is no need to calculate the mid-parental height. It is there in the right-hand corner. So you, uh, you can join the father's height and the mother's height and then the centile will be given there. And if it is a girl, at the centile, you go to the right and then you, you can read the mid-parental height. And if it is a boy, you go to the father's side and read it. So please learn this, this type of chart. There is no need for any calculation. This is the pediatrician's simplified chart. Now, what is the growth velocity that is accepted? So whenever there is a child with growth failure, we will be looking at, we will observe them for a period of time. What is the growth velocity which is acceptable? Is it third sendile, 10th sendile? Accept it up to 25th sendile. Okay. If a child is growth velocity is in this 25th sendile curve, you can accept it. If it is below 25th sendile, it's better to investigate. Okay. And what do you think arm circumference? Is there any relevance for the mid-upper arm circumference? Muwak, we say. 
six months to 60 months, it is one value. Is there any significance? It has got less significance now because now we have the arm circumference charts. And we know that every year the arm circumference, mean, median, mode, everything is changing. But still we keep this mid upper arm circumference less than 12.5 as MAM and less than 11.5 as SAM because there are some resource limited places where you cannot have the arm circumference chart or any chart with you. So this is still relevant. And this is very good to identify children at high risk of dying. I have a MAM or a SAM with me. And if the mid upper arm circumference is less than 11.5 centimeters, that is a high probability of mortality is there. That is why we are still keeping this. So what is the relevance? It can pick up a child who is at risk of dying. And what do you understand about BMI cutoffs? IAP says, five to 18 years, go for 23rd adult equivalent and 27th adult equivalent. So BMI cutoffs below five years is like more than two ST. Whether it is weight, length, etc., we take two standard deviations or two Z score, whereas above five years, it is one Z score. Okay, so that is a change. So above five years, it is one Z score. If you look up WHO charts and more than two Z score is obesity. This is above five years. Below five years, it is two Z score. And CDC says that if it is above 85th centile, it is overweight and more than 95th centile is obesity. But IAP says 23rd adult equivalent, 27th adult equivalent, which is complementary to 71st and 75th sendai. See, because we have more abdominal fat and our waist circumference is more, this is the sendai. We cannot wait up to 85th sendai or 95th sendai. That is something which I want you to learn. Okay. What is refeeding syndrome? In Malnutrition child, if we start the feeding suddenly, that may result in uh, electrolyte imbalance. Na? Hyperphosphatemia. And even, even it can cause a cardiac arrest. So yes, three yes, to yes. six weeks of therapy, it is often self-limited. So, so many hypos come. Hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, but there can be hyperglycemia, fluid retention, cardiac arrest eh? sometimes. But that is why nowadays we go very cautiously, you know, one gram protein per kg per day we start and then, then slowly we reach to 3 gram, then to 6 gram. Okay. Energy also we go 75 to 100 uh, kilocalories per kg we start and slowly we re reach up to 200. So then, so there can be tremors, Koshi shake we used to see, hepatomegaly, cardiac failure, etc. Apparent worsening of the child. How do you do appetite test? How much RUTF has to be given for RU, RUTF has to be given? It is usually weight into five. Three kg, 15 gram is given. Okay, weight, there is a chart which, which is given by WHO, but you can take weight into five gram. And what is the difference between RUTF and RUSF? RUTF is a patented product and it has got 500 kilocalories, 15 gram protein and lot of micronutrients. And government of India said, no multinational should make money out of our malnutrition. So they said, you prepare indigenous products. And we started making cereal pulse, skimmed milk powder, oil, etc puffed rice and all we used to take and then make our own products. But that is that may not meet the criteria of 500 kilocalories in 100 gram, 15 gram protein and micronutrient fortification we cannot do. So it is little inferior. 
but it is well and good. That is RUC, RUSF, ready to use supplementary food. Initially, it was used for MAM only, but now we know that all SAM need not be admitted, no? There is a community management of CMAM is there, no? Community management of acute malnutrition. So we can use the RUSF. Now, how many micronutrients have a national program or a national consensus? I have written, we have a target of seven. See, vitamin D3, there is a NNF and IAP recommendation and a consensus that we can give, we will give 400 IU per day till one year, isn't it? So that is a universal recommendation. That is you. Iron and folic acid is a life cycle approach and it is a universal recommendation. Around the life cycle, we have to take the iron and the folic acid. Vitamin A is a universal recommendation. Nine mega doses are given. Uh, nine months, 18 months, like that, up to 16 months. And one lakh is given when the child is less than one year and less than eight kg. And two lakhs is usually given when the child is more than eight kg and more than one year. And some people say vitamin A, there is, we can stop the program. But I am supporting the program because the Comprehensive National Nutrition Survey of 2016 which did retinol levels, found subclinical vitamin deficiency in our children. And it, it is found to reduce all-cause mortality. It may not reduce diarrhea, measles, or pneumonia, etc. But all-cause mortality is less. Then the fifth micronutrient, which has a universal program, is iodine. And zinc has a targeted program. What is the targeted program? When will you give zinc? Any episode of diarrhea, isn't it? 10 milligram less than six months and 20 milligram more than six months for 14 days. And then the seventh group I will say is vitamin K. We are giving to all babies. And we, we have to supplement B12, especially in the vegans. So these two, vitamin K and B12 are synthesized by our gut. So our if our gut is not producing enough or our diet is not bringing enough, we may give it. So how many micronutrients are targeted? Seven groups like the, that is why. What is the other name for micronutrient revolution? Anybody? Mind. Rainbow revolution. It is called rainbow revolution. Cultivating and consuming colored vegetables and fruits. And have you seen this, uh, this page? It is written, mention the date of provision of IFA bottle and whenever the IFA is given to the baby, provide iron folic acid every Wednesday and Saturday. Have you seen this chart anywhere? It is there in the MCP card. How many of you have seen the MCP card? What is MCP card? Mother and Child Protection Card. Ah, it is a booklet, no? There is a page, six months onwards, bi-weekly IFA has to be given and documented. What is the new program for iron prophylaxis? Anemia mukt parad. So, anemia mukt parad. And what is severe anemia for a one-year-old child? Less than? Seven. Very good. Seven gram. I am projecting it. What is uh, severe anemia for a um, 12 year old? Less than eight. Huh? Eight. Huh. And now the ane anemia mukt parad is recommending bi weekly iron for all children six months to 59 months and weekly iron for five to nine years. And then school going, we. WIFS, that is weekly iron folic acid. Now the, uh, the entry coated tablet is changed to sugar coated tablet. And mind you, I told you that 45 milligram is the tolerable upper limit of iron. We were giving 100 milligram. Now we have, we have reduced it to 60 milligram and made it sugar coated. Please check the supply 
what you are getting whether it is 100 mg sugar coated or uh, uh, entry coated or 60 mg that uh, the other is entry coated is more because bioabsorption is less for micronutrients a three pronged approach should be there what is that three pronged approach one is dietary diversity okay that is the rainbow revolution avoid overcooking include all the colored vegetables and fruits all food groups this is best for long term but are we all able to do that many people are not able to do that so the next best may be food fortification that is you add iron vitamin d everything the, even the milk is now coming with vitamin d a and d fortified it is very good for short term goal but it is a very expensive thing and very good for short term goal is nutrient supplementation and but we have been given for decades we are doing the ifa program but our anemia is more than 50% isn't it so the there is poor complaint so we have to innovate and one innovation which the united nations is recommending is unimap what is that oh, oh, most of the vitamins and minerals are given as a sprinkle and the mother can sprinkle it in a salad and take it so but i don't know why it is not being implemented there is even b12 is there iron is there zinc is there so many are there so just know that this is an innovation which have been suggested it can be given as a pill also or a sprinkle but what are immunonutrients what you understand by immunity and nutrients what is nades n a i d s what is aids immunodeficiency ah so in nutritionally acquired immunodeficiency syndrome the mucous membrane is defective physical barriers are not there the macrophages are not working the humoral response is less the t cells are low isn't it so immunonutrition speaks about mostly 10 food groups or 10 nutrients vitamin a the b complex c d e zinc selenium copper iron and the others glutamine arginine etc so this should be optimized so that we can our body can react to any stimulus can you boost your immunity people say you can boost it but remember that this also can cause hypervitaminosis can you boost it in health will our immune system be active if there is no stimulus or no nothing there it will be optim optimally sitting there no only when an antigen or virus is coming we will act so optimization is the best term rather than boosting maybe in a ill health situation when somebody is supposed to respond to the infection or the antigen they are not doing it we can boost it so i believe that immuno boosting can be done in a stage of illness but in health what is to be done optimize the nutrition if i increase my secretions by boosting will it be good no if i increase my cytokines will it be good in health no if i increase my antibody production will it be good no so optimization is the best thing for health and maybe immuno boosting can be done in certain selected cases of ill health so what is the diet a b and c in person diarrhea we speak about a low lactose diet 50 ml per kg of milk is given and it is not given as milk such it is given as a rice kanji or a along with some puffed rice powder etc no don't give not give it as as such milk will be in a reduced quantity and if the child is not better we go for b diet what is b diet it is a lactose free diet again rice is there you can give some good 
source of protein. So it is a lactose-free diet. What is diet C? It is a starch-free and lactose-free diet. So only non-vegetarian, egg white, chicken puree with the glucose, it is a monosaccharide diet. What are the advantages of zinc in diarrhea? I tell you can give me 10, at least seven advantages of zinc, giving zinc. It corrects zinc deficiency, if any, which is rampant. I showed you the hidden hunger index, isn't it? And in comprehensive nutrition survey, they did zinc. It was deficient in at least 40% of the children. There is loss in diarrheal stool. Zinc regulates fluid and electrolyte balance and absorption. Zinc promotes epithelial repair. It improves the taste. It improves immunity. Thus, it prevents even recurrence of the diarrhea. So you must be able to tell at least five or six reasons why you give zinc in diarrhea. Now, I, I said uh, earlier, I said carbohydrate should be 55 to 60 percent. Now, I am giving a diet, carbohydrate is less than 50 percent. Which is this diet? It is a diet for a diabetic child with diabetes. I say D diet is not a diabetic diet, it is a disciplined diet. Okay. Then the question may come, what is glycemic index? What is glycemic load? Glycemic index is how much blood sugar elevation will come following eating one item. For example, if I take biscuits, dates, potatoes, my glycemic index will be sky high. Suddenly my blood sugar will go up. So what is glycemic load? That is also very important. Glycemic index into carbohydrate content divided by 100. Glycemic load more than 20 is very high. For example, I, I want to eat pineapple and I want to know what is the glycemic load I am going to get. 59 is the glycemic index and the carbohydrate content in 100 gram is 10.8 divided by 100. So it is 6. So it is a low glycemic load diet. That is how you do it. So how will you give uh, items to a celiac child, celiac disease? What items can you give? So this is medical nutrition therapy. That also can be asked in the viva, nutrition viva or in a nutrition OSCE. Even do not share a mixer. No answers. Avoid low density diets. Ah, wheat, barley, rye. And oats is questionable, but they say that oats has usually wheat contamination. Maybe they are grown together, etc. So we can give all fruits, dry fruits, vegetables, non-vegetarian milk items, pulses, legumes, cereals, except the ones in the avoid list. And also we must tell them rava, suji, maida, bread, biscuits, cakes, pastries, noodles, chocolates, malted drinks, ice cream, ready to eat soup, everything contains gluten. And sometimes we give them a hidden, hidden gluten source also. Honey, tetra pack of curd, ice creams, ketchup, like that. Huh? canned fruits. So this is, uh, this you can study something, at least you must know. There is a hidden source of gluten also. Galactosemia, what diet are you going to give? A child with galactosemia? Lactose free, isn't it? They cannot take any milk or milk products, including breast milk, exclude, butter, ghee, baked food. But there are also other things to be avoided. Peas should be avoided if RBC enzyme is low, they say. Canned food and liver. So what, what they can get? They can be on soya, soya milk, cereals, less pulses. 
in moderation only pulses should be given they can take nuts oil non dairy cream vegetables and fruits not canned only fresh items then they can take the non vegetarian items but it is better to avoid the liver because some stores may be there then some question about food allergy also we can ask in that station is it permanent food allergy what do you know about what are the usual allergens and is it permanent many have answered no madam so you must say the you the common allergens are cow's milk and the black curve says that they get over it by school age earlier the onset they get over it earlier hens egg the green they get over it by school age but peanuts seafood fish etc is going to remain so i asked you again a question are you familiar with the mcp card how many of you look at the mcp card every mother and child has a unique id and they have a booklet like this please go to the ward and ask the mothers to show the mcp card it is a wonderful booklet for us to capitalize and it is speaking about the home based newborn care it is speaking about well child visits so now 11 visits we have to call them and i sometimes i say pediatrics is shrinking no the childhood diseases are all disappearing and we are we may become jobless but we have to concentrate on the healthy children on the growth development immunization and all of the normal babies so let them let us call them for 11 visits less than 7 days one visit should be there 6 weeks 10 weeks 14 weeks 6 months 9 months 6 months the visit is very very important it is for complementary feeding and we say speak for 6 minutes on six items six attributes of complementary feeding to every baby at six months that is quantity quality frequency texture taste and hygiene so six things you have to teach them and nine months again that is the time when we usually add the non vegetarian items and all and 12 months call them that is the time then they are going for the family pot feeding 18 months 24 months and 30 months 36 months and ecdn early childhood development and nutrition we capitalize on this we teach with this uh, uh, mcp card i sometimes look at the mcp card and say if you know that you can you can pass dch everything is there so nutrition and growth monitoring developmental surveillance is there then health danger signs newborn screening is there responsive parenting is there early learning environment is there so all the components of ecdn is there in the mcp card and now in kerala with the support of unicef we are we are doing the ecdn workshops and all of us are holding what the mcp card and we keep a, a station like this i am an ecdn champion so how many of you are ready to become an ecdn champion you can type in the chat box so you can please type in the chat box we have raised their hands sir they very good they are they have raised their yes excellent so i think i will leave some time for interaction or any questions so we can uh, even uh, so we can just ask about the food items written there or we can ask about diseases and diet during diseases some mcp card can be kept there we can keep some growth charts there and talk uh, and then uh, make it very interactive i hope uh, this was uh, useful it was it was not just useful madam it was comprehensive i think you covered the whole textbook of uh, nutrition ananda kesavan sir also is there shweta can you all uh, can you unmute everybody if anybody has any questions they can ask uh, there is, there is a question nutrition recovery syndrome and refeeding syndrome are the same nutrition recovery syndrome was the original name when it was seen in nrcs and all now 
we uh, preferably call it as uh, um, prefading syndrome. Shweta, can you unmute everybody? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Everyone can un unmute and ask their doubts. Anybody is uh, anyone and anyone wants to answer anything? On the case seven, sir, you are there online. Yeah, it's a very wonderful talk. What we are doing nowadays, safeguard program. We are also stressing MCP card. Safeguard program is a school admission card. So you want to include development, growth, weight, everything. We are to, it is not simply a immunization card. Our idea is that uh, compulsory immunization card before school admission. So it is not only immunization guard, but we include, as Madam mentioned, we included all the aspects so that we will get more and more uh, appreciation from the parents. Thank you, Madam. It's a very good talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andhagashan, for that input and the comments. Um, uh, I, I, I actually, have no... uh, yeah, one thing I want to tell you. Uh, when we were students, we were taught about well baby clinics. And then slowly, slowly it became uh, immunization clinic. Now, let us revive it back as well, baby clinics. Okay. Otherwise, no immunization only, they come. Yes, ma'am. So, please start the well, baby clinic and the 11 visits. I think uh, you can just read, just go through the chat box, ma'am. I have no time. I, there, it was comprehensive. And all, one question is there, when supplement of iron is in normal baby with normal weight is recommended? All babies, irrespective of their uh, weight or um, gestational age, uh, six months post term, up to six months, 180 days of lactation, the mother is taking the IFA tablets. During pregnancy, previously we were taught that it's 100 tablets. Now it is 180 tablets to cover the whole of six months. And after that, the baby has to be given iron and it, it is there in the MCP card. So, and the, uh, that is why I showed that it, there is a Wednesdays and Saturdays. Even that day is also fixed for the mother to give it. And uh, low birth weight babies and preterm babies, we start maybe at two to four weeks of gestation. We start and we tell them to continue till one year. And after that, they have to merge into the, the ECDN program. That is Anemia Mukt Bharat program says that Bi-weekly iron has to be given. And when they reach the school age, it becomes weekly iron. Thank you so much, ma'am. Isn't think... it four months somebody is asking? Uh, it, is, it, I, it is not four months. In preterm, we are starting earlier. In term, normal babies, six months post-term. Because up to six months, the mother is taking the IFA tablets. And the dose of iron, the dose of iron please go to the website Anemia Mukbarad and read it. It's a wonderful toolkit. It says only 3 milligram per kilogram per day. We don't want to give it to 6 milligram because one is, uh, our gut is very bad gut, no, with a lot of H. pylori and other parasites and all sitting, a lot of inflammation in the gut. So iron absorption will be less and unbound iron in the gut can cause free radical damage. And E. coli can thrive. Infectious morbidity can be more. So they only recommend 3 milligram of elemental iron per kg per day for treatment. Otherwise, uh, it is 10 milligram. So uh, uh, that is 10 milligram of iron and 100 microgram of folic acid. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. I think you cover, in one hour you covered the whole nutrition. Bio. I was told the, by the uh, students who are now SRs that nutrition was a very tough viva for them. I think after going, they can all go through your classes. It is recorded in YouTube. Uh, I think they should not have any doubts about nutrition. My only question is... Uh, how do you manage to be updated and uh, always give us new things, madam? I, I mean, there is every class, there is something new for all of us. Uh, we think we have read your textbook so many times I would have read. There was so much more for me to know today. So I, that is the only question for you from my side. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. That okay. is my passion. 
<laughs> I understood, madam. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for this great opportunity. The White Army had been wonderful. Huh? And yeah. this topic, usually it is not, uh, many, many uh, got very fascinated at this topic that you have selected. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I think uh, it, it was full all through, 100 participants in the Zoom and then a lot of people were watching on YouTube. It was difficult to coordinate the chat box uh, between the two. So, uh, but... but uh, uh, now we know, no? Yes, 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 ma'am. Cow's you. milk protein allergy, there is a question. If it is, a, if it is an exclusively breastfed baby, less than six months, we have to, the mother will have to stop all milk products. If the baby is on formula and breast milk, first stop the formula and see. And still, if the baby is persisting only, you change the diet of the mother. And then we may go for if the um, it is not uh, breastfed or even after stopping the formula on breast milk also, the baby is having blood in stool and uh, not thriving. Then we may go for the, um, the hydrolyzed formula, which is very, very expensive. But after six months, we have an option of giving the complementary food as well as going for soya formula. Soya formula is not recommended below six months. But if they cannot afford the um, hydrolyzed formula, which is very, very expensive, 3000 rupees per tin and all, then we may relax and give the soya. And soya milk allergy can be there in those who have cow's milk allergy also. Sometimes it may be difficult game. But usually what we say is that if formula fed, stop formula. If breastfed, mother to stop all the, uh, and, uh, the milk products. And after several months, maybe after a year or so, one year, you may challenge little bit of milk and see whether the baby has outgrown it. I said earlier the onset, earlier they outgrow it. But by school and re school age, most of them will outgrow it. Yes, Thank you so much, ma'am. We would like to have you many uh, for any, uh, other nutritional cases and other nutrition related things. Thank you so much for the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Good Stay night.